African American Legends series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as aviation, sports, business, literature, education, and politics. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they'd been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and joining us on today's program is C. Virginia Fields, the borough president of the Great Borough of Manhattan. And Virginia, glad to have you with us on African American Legends. Thank you. you <coughs> Thank are, you. You are a legend in the sense that you are the second African American woman to be borough president of Manhattan. Tell us about the first and tell us about why you wanted so much to be borough president of Manhattan. Well, first of all, let me thank you, uh, Roscoe, for uh, the opportunity to join you. I think this is a very important way to talk about some of the past, present, and where we might be going in the future. The first woman to serve in this position, African-American woman, of course, uh, was um, Constance uh, Baker Motley, Motley Baker. And she uh, now is uh, sitting as a federal um, a judge here in the state. And uh, that's an important person to follow because of her legend. She uh, was very active mm -hmm. in the civil rights movement and worked very closely with Thurgood Marshall in terms of the desegregation of the schools mm -hmm. and has an extensive record in civil rights. And she really paved the way. So it was very exciting for me to have her actually uh, do the installation mm -hmm. for me back in January. And of course, while I'm the second African-American woman, I think I'm about the fifth African-American to hold that post, mm -hmm. uh, following Percy Sutton, David Dinkins, and Hewlett Jack much earlier. So it's an important position for several um, reasons. One, as a borough president, and for um, cities who do not have a similar position, I guess the equivalent would be a county leader someone who is the county leader, county executive rather, mm -hmm. uh, speaking on behalf of that county as it relates to budgetary issues, services, being an advocate for getting that county what it needs by way of its government. So I'm a spokesperson on many issues of importance, education, economic development, housing, senior concerns, and certainly health care. And at a time when we need uh, to have voices heard in the larger arena of city government here in New York City, being a spokesperson for the 1.5 million people who live here in Manhattan is a very important and really exciting role. It really is exciting. <coughs> and of course, we're very excited to have you as a borough president because it's a long tradition here. You talk about Hewlett Jack, you talk about Percy Sutton, you talk about Connie Motley, <coughs> you talk about David Dinkins, right. who be, went on to be mayor. We won't ask you about your aspirations there, <laughs> but uh, we uh, have had a long tradition. Now, in terms of the geography of New York City, uh, I'm from the Bronx, as you know, as president of Bronx Community College before I was at the Graduate Center here, and we were fond of saying the Bronx is the only part of New York City that's attached to the mainland. That's right. Because the rest of New York is an island. That's You've right. got uh, Manhattan, and we've got uh, Brooklyn and Queens, which are part of Long Island. You have Staten Island. But this very interesting structure where Manhattan, which is really New York County, which many people think is New York City, Times Square, Rockefeller Center, Harlem, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, you represent as a city council person, Wall Street, that's New York. And yet we know that of the 7.2 million people who live in New York, uh, a larger number live in Queens and Brooklyn and just a few less in the Bronx and a few less than that in Staten Island. So all of a sudden, here we have the, the key to New York City, Manhattan, New York County, with a leader, uh, the borough president, who's African-American, and it goes back some 30 years. Uh, I think there was one white, your predecessor, Ruth Messenger, right. who was a borough president just before you. In but terms of women, right. In terms of women, right. and so we, we have this role the borough president used to be even more important in terms of the budgetary aspect because we had this unique thing called the Board of Estimates. Right. Where <laughs> the mayor and the city council president, the borough presidents voted on everything from land to taxes to allocation of resources. Mm -hmm. And because of the uh, charter revision, the borough president lost some of th those budgetary powers 
but picked up some other power. So could you talk about how in charter revision, even though it took away some of those budgetary powers, how it in a sense enlarged some of the powers of the borough president? And I, I think that's a very important point because um, the role of the borough president often gets discussed in terms of having lost some of the powers uh, as a result of the elimination of the Board of Estimate. And I guess that's true to a certain extent because budgets were basically decided upon by the mayor and the borough president. Having been a member of the city council for the past eight years, where we now share in that um, uh, role with a mayor, uh, I've experienced it on that side. Now, moving to the office of borough president, where I never experienced the Board of Estimate, it's not a loss at all mm -hmm. for me, but really an opportunity to expand on the areas that are uh, the responsibility under the charter as land use. The borough president has the responsibility for making land use um, decisions in their borough and in Manhattan that is extremely important because as you said Manhattan is a part of the five boroughs but most people think of New York City being Manhattan the tall buildings uh, the institutions our cultural institutions Wall Street the financial center all that New York City and Harlem and Harlem <laughs> absolutely um, all that New York City has to offer in terms of people coming to visit New York and that's good but we also have communities where we live we live on those blocks so we don't want over development we want to make sure that we have uh, adequate resources our schools uh, transportation so that as development moves forward a borough president is very concerned about how the residents live in this borough so our voice on land use issues uh, is an extremely important one. And coming from the city council where I served as a member of the land use committee mm -hmm. and chaired one of the subcommittees, I'm very familiar with the land use issues and development. So I'm taking that experience into the office of the borough presidency. We also are cons uh, involved in terms of economic development. Borough president every three or four years has to submit a report on the economic development growth and issues within their borough. Now that is extremely important because again, Manhattan being the center for so much of the energy and the engine that drives the region, we still have neighborhoods throughout Manhattan, Lower East Side, Harlem, Washington Heights, East Harlem, parts of the West Side that have not received the kind of attention in terms of opportunities for economic growth that I think exists there. When we talk about tourism, it is up significantly here in New York City and specifically Manhattan but we have not maximized the opportunities in Harlem, which is itself a cultural institution, as you very well know. To be able to attract tourism into northern Manhattan, not only does it allow for people visiting the city to experience the richness of what the heritage and the culture that exists in Harlem, Washington Heights, and East Harlem, but it brings money into those communities. Tourist tourism is booming in this city. So we're looking at ways to promote that in northern Manhattan. So a borough president can be very key and instrumental as a part of that. Education, borough president appoints a member to the central board of education. We have a seven member board and there are five borough presidents. Each borough president makes an appointment of one person and the mayor makes an appointment of two. And they decide policy and issues related to the education of our children. So all of those are very important roles in terms of our appointment process, our involvement with making critical decisions around budget. We still have input. We do not approve the budget, but we make recommendations for capital projects and development that has to do with anything other than programs and services. And we still get to allocate a percentage of the dollars for support of programs and services. So there are lots of different things to be done. And I think the most important thing to me, Roscoe, is the fact that having a voice, recognizing again, that even though we're in Manhattan, the many neighborhoods that have not been uh, consistently brought into the uh, consideration of funding, equity, 
economic development opportunities and certainly education, housing, and we want to be able to move those agendas along. Well, I'm sure the audience can see from that wonderful litany of responsibilities for the borough president that you not only know what they are, but you're ideally suited to deal with those, which brings me back to your previous existence as a councilwoman. Because in one sense, you say, well, when I'm in a council, I vote the budget, I'm very powerful. Now I'm the borough president, I have to oversee and advocate. Uh, tell me about how you feel about this difference in role between the legislator who approves a budget and the borough president who advocates for the budget. There is a difference. Um, I mean, I think that for me, it's uh, one of growth, too, mm -hmm. because prior to um, moving into the city council professionally, I'm a social worker, so I worked mm -hmm. as a social worker. But throughout that time, I also was very actively involved at the community, serving as a member of our local community mm -hmm. board. So I sort of came into this from the ground up. For the audience who doesn't know what the community board is, mm -hmm. could you explain that in terms of the continuum of right. governmental services? Community boards, by the way, are members, of volunteers at a community level who are appointed by the borough president. Mm -hmm. So another uh, power for another the board. Another power yeah. of the borough president, and they community board districts are defined by our city planning commission. They're roughly represented maybe about two hundred fifty thousand residents. And you have 50 people serving on a community board who really are involved with local issues, land use, budgetary issues, city services, advocating locally, but they're all volunteers. And I served on that board for a probably in my own district of Harlem for about seven years, and I chaired that board. So all of the experiences gained there helped me as I moved to the city council knowing the local communities and being able to uh, legislatively work on their behalf and through the budget. While it's a difference being a mm -hmm. member of the, of being the borough <laughs> president, all of the experiences gained at the community board level, city council level, now service me in terms of addressing a borough wide on the same kind of issues. So the experience of a borough, I'm sorry, a council member were more narrow in scope because I was representing a district roughly of about 150,000 residents. As borough president, I represent 1.5 million people now. But the experiences gained there, I build on them. And when I advocate now on behalf of the budget, not voting, but advocating, I'm able to do it uh, with an understanding of the process good relationships with members of the city council, and how to focus resources in areas that have been underserved. So I see it as a growth. I see it as another step in the process of city government. And uh, because of where I've been, I'm now able to do that in a way uh, that I think is much more knowledgeable, uh, from a, certainly from a knowledge base, than someone perhaps who had not been there. Legislatively, I can still make recommendations for legislative initiatives to be considered by the City Council through City Council members. As a matter of fact, we are involved now in calling for some hearings on uh, some issues that are very important in the city as it relates to our public hospitals to make sure that we continue money going into the public hospital for adequate staffing and uh, continue to um, improve quality of care. So I can do that through a city council member and still get things done legislatively. The, your career shows an interesting continuum of political activity. I'm sure you're a, a social worker by profession. You were involved in the civil rights movement, yes. I know. Uh, you then get involved in the community board. And then you get elected to city council. Then you get elected to borough president. Now the charter revision, and I was one of the people who testified on the ta charter revision, uh, brought up this concept of term limits, which some of us uh, were not so happy with. Mm -hmm. Because you get an experienced person, and it's very clear by listening to you, you have a litany uh, of areas of knowledge and concern 
you know the numbers, you know the principles, what different parts of government do. And all of a sudden, with term limits, at some point in time, you will drop off the cliff. You will not have this job. Right. What do you think about the concept of term limits? In some ways, you've been benef you were benefited by it because uh, certain other positions opened up. That's the principle, mm -hmm. that if you have term limits, you don't have professional people just staying there. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you talked about, what, six years on the council, seven years uh, mm -hmm. on the community board, now a, a year in the uh, borough president. Now you've got eight, ten years of, well, no, 15 years of right. experience right. in government. Uh, you are a valuable resource. Term limits at some point will cut you <laughs> off unless you aspire for higher office. One of the arguments is that uh, by term limits you pu pu push people up. Right. But then the question is what happens with this complicated legislative process? I, I believe in 2002 uh, the whole city council will be gone. Right. There will be new people right. there. Now, of course, the point is educated people and committed people can work out something. Mm -hmm. But as I heard you talk about what you did and what you uh, want to do uh, and what you advocate for, there's a continuum, a continuum of experience, continuum of thought, continuum of interactive personalities. Because even though the paper says that council people vote, it's really personalities who are council people who mm -hmm. vote. Mm -hmm. And it's the interaction there. Now, how do you see this? How, uh, what's your idea well, about term limits and its impact on the political process? Well, I, too, um, uh, voted in opposition to term limits. I think that it, it, it denies voters the right to select people whom they wish to represent them. I think that the argument many people had in terms of term, supporting term limits was because you can't run against an incumbent. I ran against an incumbent when I was first mm -hmm. elected to the city council. We can cite many examples of how that can be done so we know it can happen. I think that it denies people the right to vote for whom they would like to have representing them. It certainly does uh, cut off uh, uh, significant experience once a person has gained that within a short period of time because here in New York City term limit only allows for people in city elected offices to serve two terms and that's eight years. Eight years is a very short time in the life of doing good work in city government. So, so it's also a long time if a person isn't doing good work. <laughs> <laughs> that's the and that's where, <laughs> that's where voters have their choice. They cannot <laughs> re-elect the person again, mm. and that's a choice as, mm. as voters that I think should not be mm. taken away. So I think that there is uh, uh, some important uh, reasons for maintaining it. The other thing I think is that the way it will happen in New York, everyone goes out of office at the same time. The mayor, the controller, public advocate, all five borough presidents, and all 51 members of the city council. I think that if term limits had to be, it should have been done on a mm -hmm. staggered basis so that you mm -hmm. aren't turning over government every eight years totally. I think that it leaves room only for the permanent staff, and there are many permanent staff in government, and quite frankly, um, lobbyists, people who know, have relationships with people, to have much more control and input into decisions than people who were elected to have. The other thing I think that's going to be impacted unless we make changes in our city charter is that you're elected, you start serving your term the first of any given year. That is the same time when we're coming in in the middle of our fiscal year. Our fiscal year in New York, as you know, is July 1st through June 30th. So anyone coming in in the middle of the fiscal year, January, has now got to try to put together a budget real quick in order for approval by the end of June. Unlike the state, we must, by charter, uh, pass a budget by June 30th. Otherwise, the Emergency Control Board, the Financial Control Board takes over. So there are some related charter mandated responsibilities that I think must be discussed and perhaps changed as a result of term limits budget stuff, and other kinds of things that are required of a mayor and a city council at the very beginning of their term. So I think it could be very disruptive. I'd like to see it revised again. 
only to do staggered if the, it is the voter's choice to have term limits, which I don't support, but voters have said, voters have spoken, I accept it. But in a staggered manner, rather than the way it will get unfold. I understand that some hearings are currently underway in the city council about making some revisions uh, in terms of staggering terms and maybe altering the uh, time at which the uh, elected officers take hold. Mm -hmm. uh, the question that comes to my mind is, uh, you recall, this was uh, term limits was promoted by a uh, person by the name of Ron Lauder. Right. And oh, he spent I over, a, <laughs> over a million dollars to get this across. And I yeah. don't really believe that the majority of the public totally understood the ramifications. They understood throw out the rascals. Right. That there's some people have been there too long. But my argument has always been you have term limits every election day. Exactly. You can vote out the person. Of course, the counter argument is that someone's in power can manipulate the situation. Um, staggered terms certainly will uh, help to alleviate the problem of having everybody leave at the same time. It's an interesting issue. But let's turn to another issue, which I know you're really interested in. That is an involvement of young African Americans in the elective political process. Going back 30 or 40 years ago, many young African Americans, whether they be lawyers or teachers or social workers or doctors, or accountants or, or manufacturing people, avoided politics because they said there's not much we can gain from it. Right. Now we know by virtue of having had mayors of the largest cities, we have the governor, the senator, Carol Mosley Braun, that we can make a difference. We have cabinet officers. Yet we still find that many of the very able young African Americans avoid politics. They may make a contribution to a candidate, but now nah, I don't want to get into this. It's too dirty. It, you don't get any reward. You don't make any money. What can really be done to encourage more African American youth to get into politics? Well, first of all, from my perspective, I see public service by way of elected office or appointed office as one of perhaps the most valuable contributions mm -hmm. any of us can make because we are defined in neighborhoods, how people live, where resources go, and that is how I discuss it, especially when I'm dealing with young people in their schools, that you're sitting here in a public school, somebody makes decisions about the resources that come into your school, whether or not you have computers, whether or not the roof gets fixed. So I try to put it on a, uh, give a face to it, put a face on the situations of how people in elected office uh, impact their lives. So I think more talking, uh, you know, and interaction with young people would be very helpful to get them to understand the role that elected people play or mm -hmm. politicians, as we are called, how we play a role in your life mm -hmm. and that you have just as much right in being a part of making those decisions as anybody else. Mm -hmm. No one goes in there knowing all of the answers because there are no scripts written mm -hmm. for it for the mm -hmm. most part. But if you enjoy public service and want to make a difference, that's the road to go down. I also think it be can become perhaps more formalized, too, through a curriculum in school having to do with civics or however we talk about government, helping the young people become acquainted through their, you know, high school, certainly, uh, years of the importance mm -hmm. of government and elected officials and politicians so that it's not a foreign thing to them and you grow up with that idea. Well, at the city university, the city university student governments has uh, promoted uh, and developed a number of elected officials. Mm -hmm. The uh, county leader in the Bronx, Roberto Ramirez, was the uh, president of the student government when I was president of Bronx Community College. Okay. And he credits me with helping to give him some of the insights that led him to uh, be a successful Classic part. example uh, of La why Larry we Warden, who is your uh, exactly. uh, colleague in the council, uh, Bronx Community College, and many others. So that's one one process you actually learn. And since the city university student governments had power, they had power mm -hmm. over uh, budgets and uh, certain student activities. So there's power. But the other thing has to do with attitudes. See, a lot of the attitudes are. The, the politicians um, are self-serving. Mm -hmm. All they want to do is get elected. Uh, they are controlled by the county. They are controlled no, by the county lot, leader. Right. All, all of that. Now, <laughs> I know, you know, that you can be mm 
-hmm. But most from our community are not. And the question is the pressure that comes from our community, which means that I give you responsibility. As a borough president, you've got to involve aggressively those young high school students, college students, young professionals, give them something to do. Appoint them to some of these boards. Set up advisory accounts. Uh, you do all these things mm -hmm. anyway. I'm mm -hmm. just re yeah. reiterating some of the things that need to be done. And I think that's very important. Involvement uh, through curriculums in the schools, through uh, internships, giving them an opportunity to serve as interns in the office, because the more exposure and the sooner it occurs, I think, uh, will give us better opportunities for many of them choosing to go into public office and run for public office. And I think a lot of it, again, just has to do with the lack of exposure. Mm -hmm. So I enjoy going to uh, high schools especially or any other gatherings, after school programs, talking with young people about what I do, how I got there, but they don't have to wait until the age of 42, mm -hmm. which is where I was mm -hmm. when I first ran for office. Mm -hmm. They can start now, mm -hmm. uh, 25, 27 years old, mm -hmm. and they have a better chance of going much further, starting mm -hmm. much earlier. Mm -hmm. And I just welcome the opportunity to do that. One thing about C. Virginia Fields is that you always accentuate the positive. <laughs> I, and I think that's very, and actually, as I talk with the public about you taking over this job, which some people say is a non-job, but you already say it's a very, very important job mm -hmm. in many ways, uh, they're very complimentary of your accentuating the positive. And I guess that's how I grew up, to accentuating the positives, even though I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, and there mm -hmm. were a lot of negatives during the time that I grew up in terms of the segregated South. But you learn how to work through uh, difficult mm -hmm. situations and keep focus and try to, you know, make things happen that are really positive. As we say on African American legends, there are many African Americans who have made things happen. And our guest today, uh, C. Virginia, whoops, C. Virginia Fields, C. it's easy to say, <laughs> C. Virginia Fields, <laughs> the borough president of Manhattan, has made things happen and she does tend to accentuate the positive. Thanks very much for being with us Thank today. Thank you so much, Roscoe. My pleasure.